So are we in a silent recession is the question. Yes, of course we are. Of course, where everybody knows we are in a recession. That is a fact. It pisses me off because of the definition of a recession. You know, I I went down this rabbit hole like a lot of you. You know, what is what is a recession? Because I think there's 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 two different things going on. There's the the government and then there's the private sector. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But the, the government's for sure propping up what I would consider to be a, a private um, a private sector recession. But I do have to, you know, laugh because, you know, you can see the headlines right now that, you know, it's the strongest economy ever and Biden's economy is amazing. Um, And it's just not necessarily, you know, the case. Well, let's look at those. Yep, there you go. So added. Now, here's the interesting thing about the GDP. Uh, As you guys know, a recession technically is two negative uh, quarters of GDP. So that's what this is. Um, and so, Jerry, go back real quick to that other. So so let's take a look at the, obviously, these, these headlines are important. What you guys may or may not know is that most of these headlines, they get revised. These are estimates, and uh, especially unemployment. Unemployment has been revised um, a lot. In fact, I think 11 out of the last 15 uh, forecasts have been revised. So in other words, they come out with an estimate, which is almost always higher than the um, than the revision. So so a lot of this stuff, when you guys see it, they, they, it's OK. It's the system that we're in. But just understand that most of these the quarters are estimates. Right. Right. And I think um, a lot of you would be surprised to know that the last couple Um, of the GDP growth has been positive. And Ken and I were surprised at that as well when we were digging into this topic. And, you know, the big question that kind of comes up would be, why? Because it doesn't feel right now like we're in a state of economic growth. Right. Like, take a look at where we are, guys. Like, things are more expensive, higher interest rates. The stock market is actually doing fine. So that has not gone down yet. But there's all kinds of theories around that. And the ability to get a loan is significantly down. So there's a, there's a massive, massive lag. There's fewer sales, um, loss of work, and output is down. And those are all, that's a contraction. And that is what's happening in the business sector. You guys are seeing it. I think last week we saw Tesla lay off again. Um, I just was looking this morning. There's another huge store um, that's closing a hundred different stores. And so there's a lag here with the way you know with the way people are doing business, uh, and it's propped up. And so Daniel and I were getting into this big conversation. Why is that? Why is it that we're all feeling this squeeze? Prices are up. I don't know anything that's gone down except you know maybe some electronics over over time. Well, no, I'm in those Facebook boards for different groups, and all I see is, does anyone have a second job? I just got laid off you know it doesn't see I can't find work anywhere right. it doesn't seem like we're in this time yeah like we were a couple years ago where there was you know everyone could get hired anywhere you know because we needed workers so badly well let's talk about the unemployment data so that was another rabbit hole we went down Jerry pull that chart up real quick because I so when when we talk about unemployment I think it's very very important to understand when they say it's 3.8 percent which is the last number obviously it went up from 3.7 percent now, one of the things that that shows that we're in a recession is rising unemployment. But this is a very interesting chart because it it looks to me like I don't know about you, but it looks to me like the Midwest is uh, is propping up the coasts for sure. Yeah, look at that in New York, three hundred and five people per every hundred thousand. Yeah. So so when you guys, by the way, I love all your opinions. You know, we're getting them from everywhere. But it's really important to understand, just like a vacancy rate for apartments or a vacancy rate for a single family or or even a, a rent growth rate, it it's not it's one huge rate <laughs> with a lot of things going on inside. And so uh, keep this up for a second, Jerry. So it's clear that you've got pretty good unemployment or growing unemployment um, in very, very uh, specific states. Obviously, California, Alaska, PA, New York uh, being some of those. Um, obviously, Connecticut, New, New Jersey, so, so you, and Rhode Island. So you do have 
real, real issues in those states. There's no question, especially if you go back, you can see that unemployment in those states have gone up, period. Now, if you look at other states, it's not going to be the same. So, you know, so what they do is they roll it all the way up into a 3.8 number. Now, some people would say that unemployment is rising. And as you guys know, that's one of the, that's the last trigger. In other words, uh, that, that's a true sign of, of lack of economic output, which is exactly what GDP is supposed to be. Yeah. And it does feel like a lot of people are getting let go or hours are being cut. And, you know, we go to, you know, a lot of restaurants and talk to people and they're kind of working an additional part-time job or they're working there because they got laid off from their full-time job. So it does feel like that's what's yeah. happening so okay so here we are in the middle of all this going what is going on what is going on so we started going down all these rabbit holes and i think you guys will like what we found so let's show the the government spending jerry let's show those bar charts all right so you want to explain these yeah so basically this is you know how the u.s is spending you know their their debt growth so they're spending money and then what it's doing uh to the to GDP, right? Yep. So as you can see, you know, in Q3, they started spending a bunch of money and then the GDP went way up. Right. And then they continue to spend and the, you know, GDP continues that trend all the way through Q4. And it's significant because whenever the government spending is way up and the GDP is way up, that's only ever happened three times, uh, three quarters in a row during like the great, um, the Great Recession. Right. So they're you know? using debt, essentially. Yeah, they're using debt to prop up jobs. Right, right. So and, and it gets counted twice. I think this is important to know. So say I put a bunch of money into... Um, Ukraine. The, <laughs> well, that's, that's one. Or the chips factory, right? Oh, yeah. And so it gives all those people jobs at the chips factory. And then when they go spend that money, that's counted twice. So it's counted when the government spends Ooh. it, and then it's counted again when the people God, that get I the money I, spend it. I wish I could do that, because <laughs> uh, I don't have to pay tax on that. So right. I'm, I'm joking. So, anyway, uh, well, this is interesting. But I think what's really interesting is you, as we all know, I was looking. You know, Jerry, let's let's click to the uh, one that shows the 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 interest costs. Uh, okay, let's let's stay on this for a minute. I just need you guys to really digest what's going on here. So let's take a look at these. This is uh, obviously you guys know we have Medicaid, Social Security, all that kind of stuff. We have defense. You know, the, technically the, the, the income that, that the government pulls in in the form of taxes or whatever it might be is supposed to offset expense. That would be, wouldn't that be nice? That would be a balanced budget. Uh, none of us could run our businesses this way for sure. But what's happened is, you know, the pandemic and there are things that we've gotten ourselves involved in, you know, obviously the, the pandemic being a big one, wars being another. And, and so this is the net interest on the deficit. Okay, so let's take a look at the, starting in about 2021, you can see it spiked. This is the red line going straight up to 2024. And there's all kinds of articles online about this. And you guys, hopefully you're paying attention. This is just the interest. So imagine this is the interest cost of what we're spending. That's what this is. This is only interest. So, so imagine if your interest costs personally were higher than your own operating expenses of your business or your house. That's essentially where the U.S. is right now. Um, obviously, in 2023, and it was all over the news, it passed Medicaid. But guess what? It just keeps on going. And then it passed defense. And now it's passing Medicare. And so for the first time ever, our interest costs are more expensive. This is just interest. So the interesting thing is... Um, one of the ways to lower this is to lower the cost of interest. And of course, we'll create another bubble. So the, this is a huge, huge thing. Obviously, we're heading into this election. We've got um, everybody's, everybody wants lowered interest rates. Obviously, that helps us a little bit. 
But at the end of the day, guys, this is uh, um, this is heading the wrong way. Uh, this is, by the way, a report that came out after the I, uh, IMF actually came out and said the the America is is uh, spending and it cannot sustain at the at the amount that it's spending. Um, and so you you know and so this is primarily the reason why GDP is exceeding. Um, year over year. And this is why we haven't called a recession. It's it's government spending. So I thought, you know, just to put some real numbers to it. Um, so the GDP uh, grew three hundred and thirty four billion. And in that same time, the government debt grew eight hundred and thirty four billion. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hold on, so don't you have to do like this or something? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take a look at that. There you go. There's the federal deficit and the GDP right there on this chart. So you guys can see, you know, this, this is not a, uh, you know, I don't really think we even need to go down a, a political rabbit hole here. This is, you can, you can label all kinds of presidents and administrations and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it, it's irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, you know, there's there's a lot of people. If if you take a look, whether it's Trump or Biden, for example, I mean, they're they're both uh, spent a lot. Well, I think what I think would be interesting is for those of you listening, you know, if you comment with your company, like what kind of company it is and if you're hiring, if you're letting people go, if you're stagnant and also if you're a government employee, like are you expanding your departments right now? I just think it would be some interesting real life data. I know my best friend just got a, a job with the city of Austin because they're expanding their department. <laughs> and so I just think, you know, that would just be interesting on the ground data for us to have. I'll tell you guys this. Like one of the things as an entrepreneur or, you know, somebody who's battling it out in the private sector, um, one of the things that you should be looking at um, is how you can capitalize on what the government wants. You know, in our space, what do they want? They want affordable housing. That's what they want. You're going to see incredible programs. So if you want to be ahead of this over the next three, five, even 10 years, you can create a whole industry and business around this. There are going to be programs just like there always have been, you know, call it Section 8 or tax credits or whatever you want to call them. There's going to be, and there are already starting to be programs, these cities, counties, states, they're all recognizing from a real estate standpoint that they have to provide um they have to provide affordable housing, both in the case of first time home buyer, whether that's a program through loans or whether that's, um, you know, um, an assistant for, for down payment. I've seen those um, and they're going to have to do it for the rental side of, uh, uh, as well, because as you guys all know from watching this channel, shelter is a huge part of inflation. It's uh, over 40 percent and there doesn't appear to be a uh, Maybe in the short term, they'll see a little bit of relief. But, man, in about two years, this thing is going to go like this. Inflation is going to go like this because with no new housing, I'm talking about the supply of, of single family, condos, apartments, whatever you want to call it. Without that, there's going to be a massive, massive inflation problem on the shelter side. Now, I'm not talking about food or energy of some of the other stuff. So, you know, this is um, this is very, very interesting. So you should be watching the window of opportunity here because let's face it, these politicians <laughs> wake up, wake up. They don't really they're not in the business. They're not in our business. They, they don't even know they're going to be fully reactive. You know, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to try to do some kind of a restriction on the landlord or the developer, stuff like that. That's the first thing. And all that does is make people move from the city or state or county or whatever it is and move somewhere else where their dollars are treated a little more fairly. So all that will happen. And then eventually somebody will wake up and they'll go, huh, we need to, we need to maybe do a, what's called a PPP, a private public partnership. You, you know, how do we, how do we do this together? How do we solve this problem together? How do we, how do we do low interest loans to create infrastructure? How do we do low interest loans to help people deliver affordable housing? Cause there's all kinds of people sitting on the sideline right now that want to do that, but their, their, their hands are tied. I think it's interesting, you know, we have a lot of people commenting and it does seem like 
a private se- uh, sector recession and then a, a government sector, you know, expansion. And that's even showing, you know, in yeah, our what, comments what are they here. Saying? Well, you know, Matt works for the water department. He said they are hiring a bunch of positions. Yeah. A lot of people are saying that their companies are either stagnant or pulling back, depending on the, the company. Um, and by the way, we have thousands of people watching right now, guys. This is right. not just a few. So thank right. you, by the way. Yeah. And then also, I do think, though, that what you have to realize is that inflation is coming whether you want it or not the fed's trying to you know make it you know slow down but you know eventually they're going to just give into it to some extent and so um somebody on here was asking you know what can i do i don't want to hear just doom and gloom yeah, like what can i, I, I love do it. yep you're right and the truth is is you need assets that move with inflation correct so anybody that's been an investor in the last few years whether it's been stocks or whether it's been real estate has done really well because of inflation and so anybody that wasn't invested in those things, that's kind of what, you know, where the problem occurred, right? Because you're trying to work and your 25 or $35 an hour no longer buys you what you it would normally would have. But if you owned a house, I mean, your house may have doubled in the last four years, right? Well, what if, if you were in the stock market, your investment may have, you know, I think it was up 70% right now. So I think that the key to learn from this is you have to be in assets that move with inflation. If you just work and pay your bills and save money, you're always going to be where you are now or in a worse spot. So I guess that's our, our yeah. you know, well, it's really the only thing that you can do to fight inflation. And I, I think there's a few things that you guys can watch. If you want to follow up on your own, go look at economies that have had high inflation. Okay. Go look at economies that have um, printed a lot of money over the past and you know what has what has done really well during that period of time so that is the right way to go look at things go look at um, like if you if you take a look at um, this is an extreme example but the hyperinflation that happened in Germany you know let's say after the war uh, you know the Deutsche Mark you take a look at that what 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 did people leave with they left with gold silver art you know, things like real estate uh, were inflated too. So, you know, w- you know, you don't have to really like guess. You can you can look at real things that happen in real economies, and see what was worth more during this during these times. I'm not saying we're heading into hyperinflation at all. In fact, it's crazy to me to think that the U.S., if you think about it, is in one of the best shapes of most most of the world i mean we were just in the uk obviously asia australia mexico canada you you know if if you are in those countries and you have significant wealth where where do you where are you going to put your money what what if you're in russia or you're in the ukraine what are you going to do you're going to do what Everybody knows they've been doing. They've been buying real estate in Miami and New York and some of those areas. Why? Because we have the most stable dollar, which is unbelievable to me because we keep printing it, printing it. We just showed the charts. So, you know, I know it's frustrating. It's probably a little bit confusing, but it isn't. If you study what's going on with money, you study what's going on with precious, uh, uh, precious uh, uh, materials. One of, we are going to have Chris Martinson on soon, by the way. He's got a fantastic book called Peak Prosperity. It talks about oil, water, timber, gold, silver. Now, he has a chart that's spectacular. And he basically says there's three kinds of wealth. And the primary wealth is everything you pull out of the ground, let's say. Okay, that's where you want to be. Okay, you want to be that. You want to be physical gold, as an example. Then the next tier are the companies that do that. You can invest in those in the form of stocks. And then the next tier is the actual stock or paper. And that's where most people come in. And that is the most vulnerable. You want to be as close as you can to primary wealth. And that is how you get through this because there's always going to be a market for water. There's always going to be a market for precious uh, materials like gold and silver and oil and stuff like that. So that's really where you need to be, guys. The more, If you're in ETFs and, and paper, uh, that if you look at the 29 stock crash, I'm telling you, that's when that's where most people lost their wealth. 
And it's interesting, too, you know, in times of high inflation, some of these countries, even in hyperinflation, your wages change daily. Yeah. Like you literally like look o- online, you know, and you have a new you have a new uh, amount you get paid every day. And because the currency is changing so fast that that's just how it works. I know. I remember. It talk- happened in Zimbabwe. And, and Mexico. Mm-hmm. I, you guys might not remember. I think it was in the 90s. I remember I was going down there, you know, playing golf and stuff in Cabo before Cabo was huge. And I would go down and come back with some cash. And then one day they just decided to add a zero <laughs> to the money. And so I went down there. I had like a 500 pesos or something. And it, it turned into 50 or something like that. And I, and, and it just immediately they just shut the shut the doors one day and said the prices are all different. And they, they on the peso, just look it up. So this happens. And the people that did really well were the ones that invested in the US. If you this it's crazy to think about this, but if you're on the border and you invested in the US even just for a week, <laughs> right. then then you can bring the money back. But, telling you. But even, you know, in w- during times of those inflation, you know, if they add a zero to the currency, that probably means you get to add a zero to your wage. And that means the landlord Correct. gets to add a zero the to their rent. That. On the other side. And yep. so what I'm saying, though, is these things keep up with inflation, but the money in your bank account doesn't because there's no extra zero there yep. and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's just that's how you're going. You know, I'm not saying we're going to go into hyperinflation, but I do believe we're going to go into a time of higher than 2% inflation. And that is what you want to do. That is what you can do. There's a lot you can do, guys. Trust me. I, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, you just got to pay attention to it. And if you're, the, if you're the kind of folks that are just turning your money over to a financial planner or a wealth manager, I just had a conversation. I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but I had a conversation with, I have, you know, as you start to make money, you start to put money in different kinds of retirement accounts legally to try to, you know, reduce your tax. Well, I've done that just like a lot of you. And I had a call from my guy, like, you know, the one call a year, you know, that you get from, you know, probably even, I think it's in the last five years, it's been three different people. But, um, um, and I'm just having a basic conversation with him about oil or silver or gold and, and he's just like, well, you know, I think you should just invest in this ETF. And I'm like, dude, like, do you have any idea what you're talking about? So the and the answer is no. But the, the point is, you guys really need to understand so that you can school the person that's managing your money. And that's the biggest lesson here, because, you know, if you're working and your and your your pay is getting scooped from if your paycheck, that's awesome. And your employers employers matching. That's awesome. But then that's really, really, really good because that means you're you're the, you're investing into something. But if you don't know what, then that's on you. And so that's really you need to understand that. And there are things that you can do if you study to to be on the right side of this because um, the last the last card to fall in this house of cards is the stock market, and that's actually what's propping everything up right now. And um, when that starts to erode, and it has, you guys, I mean, nothing ever goes up. Real estate certainly hasn't. You guys are watching that right now. So, you know, you, you just need to be in the right place and watch this because all your hard-earned money, all the, all the, your savings, or if, if you have a lot of savings, all that stuff, it's super important that you're paying attention. So I want to start to dive into our Ken Pro. I think some of these questions really go on with what we're talking about. Um, if you want to join Ken Pro, go to KenMcElroy.com forward slash join dash now. You can ask us questions. So this comes from Joseph. He said, I like the title of this video. And it seems to me that my wages haven't kept up with prices, even though I did get a 20% overall raise throughout the last few years. Can you touch on this? Yes. Well, this is exactly this. This weighs in perfectly to right. to what we were just talking about. This is, you know, I think, I think the 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 silent recession is hitting the people for sure. It's hitting my employees for sure. We've made adjustments as well, but it's also hitting businesses. So so the businesses are 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 taking it in the chin as well, and so. You know, and if if unemployment goes up, which I'm telling you, the Fed wants, the government wants, the, and it it went up from three seven to three eight, so it's not that significant. The next one is going to be really interesting to watch the next few because if it goes up, it's actually going to get worse. 
because well, that's an interesting thing you just said, because, you know, if we're propping up the government through our GDP spending, they actually might not want to, uh, unemployment to go up until after the election. It's possible. Yeah, it's definitely possible. And, you know, there's all kinds of controversy about how they're measuring part time. Obviously, the immigration issue, you know, those people, many of them are working, taking jobs. Um, you know, legally or illegally, uh, you know, and, and, and not to go down this, but it's just a fact. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, I do think that the large wage growth is over for a while because unless it's maybe government <laughs> and, uh, you know, that would that could be a potential exception. Did I answer that whole question? Kind of, but I do think we should dive into the data a little bit more, okay. right? So the average worker got about a 20%, you know, 15 to 25% raise during COVID, which was substantial. Which they needed. They needed. And, you know, um, Social Security even went up 22%. So but, one thing, before we jump mm-hmm. into that real quick, I do want people to understand, um, while I completely get it and I understand it and I agree with it, that means a 20% increase in an expense to the business. I think that's what people didn't understand. It's the equivalent of you having a 20% increase in your personal expenses. So, so, you know, while I agree with it and I know that it went up and I think it's good because inflation was going crazy. Um, it also means this is the pullback we're talking about. This is the pullback. You know, and this is why they reallocated the part time uh, category for for the unemployment rate. Right. So if they go. So if if it's all went up kind of, you know, you know, 15 to 25 percent in wages, Social Security at 22 percent, prices have went up way more than that. So prices on anything are up 25 to 100 percent. Like I'm still convinced at the grocery store it's 100 (laughs) percent because I know what I spent on groceries then and now. Well, okay. first of all, I'm going to make fun of her. Daniel will walk the aisle of the go- of the grocery store every single time. It drives me nuts. And guess what's in the cart? The exact same right. thing from the from I, the time. I online, exactly. I online like shop. If now. we just walk to the same things, then we would be out of there in fifteen minutes. But no, no. She goes through just pretend like maybe she. So so the point is, she knows what's in her basket from week to week to month to month. And um, yeah, when you can look at car prices, I mean, car prices are up 50 percent. I mean, everything's up way more than the 15 to 25 percent raise that everybody got, which means that everyone is shorter on cash. So when Joseph says he feels like his wages have not kept up, that's why I don't think most people's wages have kept up. Um, And as we were saying before, you know, investments have went up 70 to 100 percent. So the stock market's at about 70. Real estate in some areas is doubled. So it's 100, you know, 100 percent, but definitely at least 50 percent. So investments have kept up with inflation, yep. but work wages have not. If you've cashed out. <laughs> if, right. If you've cashed yeah. out. Yeah. That's a it's a like equity in a home. It's not meaningful, actually, unless you exit. Right. So, you know, you might have 100,000 in equity in a home uh, right now, but if the home prices go down, um, it's, again, it's not meaningful. Same thing with the stock market. So it's, it's, it's fake wealth until it's actually realized. So I think that's important to understand. Whereas the wages are out-of-pocket today issues. That's the point. A lot of people commented that they order the same exact food every week, just like <laughs> I do, and they walk the aisles every week, just like I do. Oh but they God. all said the same thing: it's doubled. So, <laughs> um, so to hop into the next question, the next question is from Robert. It says, "I live in a condo, and the HOA is eight eighty a month. Oof. I'm concerned with dues going up every year. Jeez. It may lose value from the dues if they go over a thousand. I was thinking of selling and buying two to three properties in Tulsa. What do you think?" Am I too worried about first the HOA all, fee first, or is well, this legit? You just brought me back, Robert. Like, I remember when my rent was less than 880. Right. This is a HOA. Like, we were joking this week. Uh, Danielle looked at me and she's like, I actually am managing my HOA more than I'm managing my tenants. Well, yeah, my tenants probably message me once every three months with an issue <laughs> that I have to send <laughs> a handyman the HOA over. Is peppering us. HO- I mean, I work with five different HOAs. I mean, I hear from three out of the five every month. Yeah. Oh, you know, something. It's always something dumb. Oh, you Remember know, we the, found five weeds in your front yard. They need pooled, or you know, she has the, an orange tree, and, and the oranges and the, have the, fell. One orange will fall, and she'll get a letter. I get a notice. Anyway, let, 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 I I digress. We digress, yeah, but so, like, okay. but the the truth is. 
is that you know these HOAs and an eight hundred and eighty dollar HOA lot. fee is That's a, a lot, lot of man. money. So first of all, a couple things on HOAs because I have a lot of experience in this. Uh, I've formed them, I managed them, I've been on the boards of countless. First of all, the bigger the apartments or bigger the condo project or uh, the bigger whatever it is the HOA, the better you're going to be because a uh, an insurance bill for example, it's going to be spread through the hole. So this 880 sounds, it's a really bougie place with a doorman and a, you know, a top a pool up top or whatever it is, but 880 is pretty high. It sounds to me like those are like Miami prices where, um, you know, think about that guys. That's almost, that's almost 10,000 a year, just an HOA. Um, to answer your question, the HOAs are getting socked just like a business, just like you. I know this for sure, okay, because, you know, we, we're involved in plenty of them. So look at all the costs that have, have gone up. You know, the co we, had, uh, we had one situation where the gates were plowed at one of our places. It took months to get new gates, and they were double of what they were. Uh, insurance costs are way up. Utility costs are way up. Water costs are way up. You know, basic maintenance and labor is way up. So that's all going to get passed back through. That's the way an HOA work. It's it's a common area. So you know if if insur if an insurance bill is 20, gr 20 grand or thirty grand a year for something for like a subdivision, it's probably going to be forty plus. And that's speaking from experience. And so they don't just take that on because they, they pass that through and so i don't see hoa costs this is the ripple effect guys the ripple effect of of these higher expenses are going to make their way through the hoa so 880 is on the high end of, of well, it's what, going to hurt your sales yeah, too you know yeah. i, I watched I watched that, you know, when I'm looking at Zillow, the, the ones with the big HOAs, there is a discount. Oh, well, we were looking at some actually mm -hmm. recently, it's been, well, maybe a month ago, where she's going, what about this? What about this? What about this? And one of them had a high HOA and we just said pass. Yeah. You, 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 take, a, you take a hit on the price for the HOA. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's, we're not even talking about the special assessments, which is another issue. Um, you know, so let me just explain real quick before I get off this topic. When you have rising costs in an HOA and an HOA board is faced with, with saying to you, hey, our costs are up and we need to raise your dues 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month or whatever it is, they're definitely not putting on new roofs or paying the project or resealing the asphalt or whatever else might be common. They're, they're pulling back at that time. And so what that means is that means they're kicking the can down the road on the capital on the things that actually, and this is not in every case because some HOAs are managed very well, but I would say the majority are managed by, you know, the the people that are retired that are walking around the neighborhoods and bitching at everything and just writing letters. And so what what's happening is, you know, they're 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 going to say, you know, let's hold off, let's kick that down the road a year. And so those are what would called be called special assessments later, because like it or not. The whole place is deteriorating annually. And if it's not maintained, then uh, it just kicks down the road. So this is another lag problem. But uh, if you're in an HOA three or four or five years from now and you've got your HOA dues going up, I can assure you they're also not doing big spendable projects. And those are going to make their way back to you in a, in a special assessment. What? I have to laugh at Queen's comment on YouTube. She said, HOA Karens are always in everyone's business. <laughs> and she put, it's Karen mania. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I hate to admit it, but it's also Ken mania too, isn't yeah. it? The other, isn't it the opposite? Yeah, the Karens and the Kens. Yeah, yeah. We we we've definitely seen our share of those. Oh. Um, that's for sure. So the next question comes from Skylar, and they're asking, "Where does the capital come from when doing a value add?" So maybe first, just quickly explain yeah, what a value sure. add is. So okay, so a value add means that you're going to spend some capital. So this is not operation money. This is actual an investment. So there could be a new roof, could be paint, could be parking lots, could be whatever it might be on the exterior, and then the more capital on the interior. That's a one-time cost. That's a typically a value add, and for that, hopefully, you get an increase in the rent or uh, the sales price. Or you know, think of a 
fix and flip. A fix and flip is you buy something that's undervalued, you put money into it, or maybe it's maybe it's valued perfectly, but you put when you put money into it, it's worth a lot more. That's a value add. So that money is always, always, always anticipated before the close. So for us, when we're doing any kind of a value add, any kind of a renovation project, I want that money up front because otherwise you're taking it from the cash flow if there is any, and um, there's no other source. Uh, and so, so you, you know, you need to anticipate that on the front end. And by the way, that's the best way to raise money. Um, this property is worth X, but when I put this money in, it's worth Y, which is significantly above that investment. And that's a value add. And that always should be anticipated in the beginning. The problem with it, of course, is that you have to pay on that. There's a uh, preferred return typically on that. And you, but you need the money in order to do the work. And so, you know, you got to better dang well make sure that um, that you're getting the increase in the value. So being in a recession isn't necessarily bad if you are informed because that's where money can be made, right? Correct. So Ken, you made most of your money in 2008 to 2013. Yes, I did. Yes, yeah. I did. And and guys, like I'm I'm, kind of, I'm telling you, I know for a lot of you who got stress and anxiety, um, we've got our share here too. <laughs> but when you make the most money is when things are like like there's bees buzzing around the nest like that's it right now like right now banks are in turmoil and they're pulling back and investors are frustrated and inflation's high and the government doesn't know what they do and either does a bureaucrat you know that works for them so okay so this is the time this is the time to like calm down and figure out where are the opportunities and there's so many i actually spoke to a guy this morning at the gym he recognized me he's from texas i was working out he's like hey i listened to your podcast yesterday and i said oh that's nice and he told me a story he's looking at a um a 3d printed house this is an interesting story and i said oh that's cool and tell me about it and he said well there uh, he went and drove and looked at it he said it's incredible 80 bucks a foot i said wow that's incredible. Now, of course, I don't know where it is. And, you know, we're just yeah. having a conversation. And he said, what do you think about that? And I said, well, we have an affordable housing problem. And if you could take that and knock out these 1,000 to 1,500 square foot places, 2,000 feet, whatever you want to call them, and, and, um, and use that technology, you now are delivering, uh, you're solving a problem for a lot of people. And, and, I, and that's what I'm saying. So, so it's sometimes you're in the middle of a in chaos and you're, and you're frustrated and you're watching too much news and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I love, uh, I was watching Tucker Carlson the other day. He said, I don't even want to, he goes, he doesn't even, wa doesn't even get on social media anymore. I thought that was an interesting comment. It was on Rogan, I think. Yep, absolutely. But, you know, so we have a video on what Ken did uh, in 2008 to 2013 and also what he's doing now. And we're going to list that below. I think it'd be really interesting for you guys to check out. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, because right. we made See. most of our money during that time. See you next week. Okay.